Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I'm a member of Gestalt IT. And each episode, we bring you a group of industry experts with uh, various opinions on some interesting topics. And we pick one of those, uh, a premise, if you will. And we try to stick to it for the entirety of the podcast. But, you know, sometimes we get into some interesting discussions. I'd like to take a moment for our guests today to introduce themselves and give you a little bit of information about who they are before we get into today's premise, starting with Jake. Hi, I'm I'm Jake Snyder. Uh, I'm a corporate systems engineer at uh, Juniper Networks in the, the PLM team. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at jsnyder81 and my blog at 2dsfromds.com. All right, Ali. Uh, hi, my, my full name is Muhammad Ali. I go by Ali. Um, I'm actually a senior uh, wireless engineer uh, for an organization called ENA. Uh, it's focused towards education sector primarily. Um, my blog, uh, my blog is artofrf.com and on Twitter, my Twitter handle is, um, M-A-L-I-E-F-46. All right. And last, Sam. And certainly least. Uh, my name is Sam Clements. I work for a large bar here in the States called Presidio. I look after the mobility practice. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Samuel underscore Clements and I blog at sc-wifi.com. All right, thank you all for joining us today. Let's jump into the premise for today's episode. Wireless planning is not exactly a cut and dried thing. There's a little bit of art to it, and there's a little bit of science too. And every so often we have a shift in the way that we look at things. Maybe it's a new protocol coming out that gives us some opportunities to make different design choices. Perhaps it could be different building types moving from a small school district to maybe like a large venue, like a stadium or an arena or something. Um, Sometimes we create rules of thumb that help us in the planning process, but maybe aren't the best design decisions. And one of those rules of thumb involves data rates, and cell sizes. Now, the premise for today's episode is that data rates don't change cell size. And I know that a bunch of you are already running for the comments because you're ready to make a comment about whether I'm right or wrong, but I'm actually gonna let our guests jump in here. And I'm gonna start with Jake because Jake is the one who actually brought this premise to us um, a long time ago. And uh, we're finally getting around to it, mostly because you know we have the opportunity to kind of dive into it a little bit, but also with some of the latest advances in wireless technology like 802.11ax and six gigahertz, I wanted to see is this still a valid premise? Jake, why do you think data rates don't change cell size? Well, I think the the, the general uh, thought process is that by trimming those rates, we shrink the cell or shrink the range at which you can uh, uh, demodulate a beacon and 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 control control plane packets or frames. And I I, I don't feel that that actually has a, a good effect on 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 the cell size. Uh, there are tons of other ways to control cell size, but uh, I feel like that just doesn't actually move the needle, so to speak, so. All right, so you're you're saying that there are a multitude of other ways if I wanted to do smaller cell sizes, say for, I don't know, like a stadium, where I was more worried about density as opposed to coverage area, because sure. there, there's I don't need wireless coverage on the field, I need it in the stands but I'm trying to play with the way that that works. Uh, but why would someone be tempted to use data rates as the cell size deterministic system? That, that's a good question. I think it comes down to how we measure. Um, when we measure, uh, most of us are familiar with getting a site survey tool, Ekahau, IB Wave, you know, NetSpot, and walking around and measuring what I can hear for Wi-Fi. And by changing, the basic rate and by changing the rates that I allow on, on that, that particular wireless LAN, um, you, you do definitely change the distance that you can demodulate that beacon. And so someone can, can go and say, well, look, see, I changed the data rate and, and my, my, my picture got smaller. Um, and, and it leads us down this path that, oh, I changed the, the cell size um, by doing that. And it, it just, I, it, it definitely can look that way, but did the RF like stop, just stop at that point? No, it, it continues on. It's just, you can not necessarily measure it or, or, or quantify it at that point because you are no longer able to demodulate it. 
I'd say that's probably pretty fair. And again, it comes back to that whole rule of thumb idea of, well, if I click this button, things get smaller. So, um, you know, that, Sam, you've had a lot of experience designing Wi-Fi, and uh, I, I don't necessarily know that you subscribe to the data rate cell size um, t uh, pairing. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, I, have, I have lots and lots of thoughts. And of course, it's obviously a nuanced conversation. I think that, um, uh, I think that uh, you know, as Jake said, you know, when you when you mash the button and you look at the picture and uh, and the cell or it looks like it's smaller, um, what he's saying is obviously you've hit a point at the boundary where you can no longer demodulate frames. I think at that point we would call them ghost frames, right? Um, they're, they're no longer demodulatable, but we have an assumption that they exist despite the fact that you can't measure them, you can't actually see them. Um, I, and, and I think that was probably the 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 premise of the whole conversation behind ghost frames way back when it happened. But I, but I think that there's um, there's a lot of uh, potential for um, changing a variable in the equation and then having having the output be true instead of false. Like if you are, for example, walking around with a native living B only wireless client and you have trimmed the one megabit per second data rate, guess what happens when that client hits the two megabit per second data rate and it and it finds the edge of that cell, it stops working because one megabit per second is no longer supported. Now, the reality is, is obviously how many of the B wireless clients do we really have in play? Uh, you know, the number is small, um, but it's the, it's, it's the exceptions that really define the rule, I think, in my book. Um, and, and that's just sort of expected behavior. If you start talking about things where there are unexpected behaviors, um, such as, uh, you know, AP manufacturers not implementing CDD for cell smoothing and things along those lines. Yeah, you, you absolutely can run into situations where you're looking at different cell sizes. Um, and that cell size that you're visualizing um, is directly impacted by the data rates that have been configured on your infrastructure. Whether that's expected or, uh, or unexpected behavior, I, I, I think is probably beside the point, but your cell sizes absolutely can change. Whether they should change or whether you want them to change is an entirely different story. See, you're making me wistful for the whole world of ethernet where my cell size is a wire that runs through the wall. And unless I've got real problems in that wire, the the coverage area is not any bigger than that wire now of course i run into the problems of having to plug the wire into my laptop and run around with it if i have connectivity and stuff like that but i want to i want to speak maybe a little bit to your example data rates of the one and two megabit data rate conversation because as we know those are very old data rates like 802.11 b era and we know for a fact that when we enable those older slower data rates we do increase coverage area but we also reduce the throughput of all devices that are connected to there because the possibility exists that my brand new MacBook Pro at the very edge of that cell may be connected at a one megabit data rate. And I've seen recommendations from wireless professionals in the industry that rather than you know designing around a different data rate and shrinking your cell size, you should just start turning off those older ones and forcing your clients to use the newer faster data rates and that effectively creates smaller cell sizes because you lose coverage past you know a few dozen feet from the ap is it smart to turn those off because i know that i've run into problems with that in my own personal use but that's mostly from legacy equipment i i, I disagree with your with the premise that uh that wired networking uh doesn't suffer from this problem because the reality is it absolutely does i absolutely have done deployments where i try where i have a, a 105 meter cable 105 yeah meter long cable and if i try and bring that link up at gigabit speeds it doesn't work but guess what when i when i hard code both ends to 10 meg half duplex link comes up just fine. What have I done? I've effectively increased my cell size by using lower data rates. Absolutely. I just happen to be doing it over a cable. Touche. I'll give you that. And having been on my fair share of those 305 foot deployments and wondering what's going on and, and having to hard code speed and duplex on an ethernet cable as actually one of the very first networking things I did as, as a professional, I see your point. I think maybe it's a little less touchy feely, a little less artistic. I mean, Ali, you, you, your blog is the art of RF. You've done a lot of these wireless deployments. 
is this cell size data rate conversation one that you have to have with customers or do they just say you know what you're the expert here you've you've configured it the way that it's supposed to be done we're not going to fight about it uh thank you tom uh so um i think i feel like there's two different parts to it um one part is um obviously uh depends on the customer right you know obviously some customers are highly technical some are not and most of the time uh, i do end up having this conversation and there's whiteboarding sessions and all that kind of stuff um so first part is obviously when the like the the cell size of rf where uh basically the plcp headers right like where how far that goes and the second part i think is uh data rates they can affect in kind of in a way where if, if i have a client for example connected to an access point and they're both like, um, you know, uh, let's say the client is like, I don't know, maybe like a, a three meters away from the access point. As the client moves away, and if the lower data rates are enabled, well, client will actually stay connected, just like you use the example of a MacBook, right? It's, it's, it's connected at one Mac, for example, and it's far away. Well, the client will also create uh, interference, actually, and, and that could be uh, that could go really far away as compared to versus if you have a lower, a higher data rates enabled, uh, now the clients will not be able to go that far and say connected to that uh, uh, access point. So that, you know, indirectly in a way you can kind of shrink the cell size in that manner. Uh, but, you know, like overall, it, you're not really shrinking it because you're not affecting the power level of that access point. Uh, one thing I, I, I like that you brought up is that, um, you know, like, it doesn't change the effective boundary of, of impact. Like clients create impact zones around themselves in terms of what their, their cell of impact is. It doesn't change that. Um, and one thing that um, we, we don't do is um, when, when we change those data rates, we're, we're, we're monkeying with both how the client hears the cell and we're monkeying with how the client can talk back to the cell. Uh, and I, I feel those take um, some a lot of nuance in terms of stability of connection. I start saying you have to talk at a much faster data rate in order to acknowledge frames and um, you know maintain your connection to the access point. Uh, suddenly, we can run into more stability problems as well, even even within the the effective cell size. And so, changing those data rates, you know, when you, when you look at it, it's much safer to do them with things like antennas and transmit power than it is with, you know, like monkeying with data rates that also have stability and performance impact. Do we get more airtime by, by trimming all those rates? Yes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the stability of those connections are still the same. Um, but this isn't an issue that was necessarily unique to wireless. I mean, we see this in LTE and 5G connectivity as well. When you're on the edge of a cell or when you're in an area where the, the, the data rate is a little bit lower, I mean, it's problematic when you have a stable but very slow connection, whereas would it be better to have a, a higher data rate requirement as a minimum to force you to fail over to a different transmitting device, whether it's an AP or a tower or something to help with quality of experience, because how many times have we gotten that phone call? Oh, the network is down. No, the network's not down. You're just connected essentially, as Sam said, at, at 10 half duplex. It's just running really slow for you. So so in essence, could could the data rate conversation, even though it shouldn't have an impact on the cell size, actually be a better quality of life improvement for people overall? I just want to point out that Tom just said that LTE and 5G are not wireless technologies. They're not Wi-Fi technologies. How's that? <laughs> Wi-Fi technologies. There you go. There you go. No, it's it's the same it's the same problem that we run into in the in the physical medium space. You have a finite amount of of, of physical transport, and that finite amount of physical transport by leveraging modulation is what gets you bits from point A to point B. Look at N base T cables, right? We we have an N base T uh, cable specification. Uh, we have devices that say, hey, despite the fact you've got a hundred meter cable, that cable might only might do ten gigs at fifty meters. It might do five gigs at seventy five meters. It might do a hundred, you know, uh, well, you know, whatever, right? You you may get different performance out of different cable lengths, not just by virtue of the fact that it's a cable length problem, but by virtue of the fact that it's a cable quality problem and length of a cable um, adds to that physical medium. And it just becomes a math problem, which is a modulation on top of that. Um, uh, you need more 
uh, you need more spectral capacity in order to transmit bits, and that's the that's the that's the that's how we get bits in and out of the air. There's this whole concept of soft landing that I see discussed in LPVs and stadiums, where you are monkeying with data rates in order to get a client to sort of to 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 roam not gracefully until it gets into its seat, and then be more okay with landing wherever it's at. But gosh, I think the, the the problem goes way beyond that. I think especially when you start talking about defects in products, you start talking about crappy antennas, uh, terrible third-party antenna manufacturers, people who are building radios and drivers that are turning features on or not, that are meant to smooth some of these things out. And the challenge is, is I don't know that anybody is making infrastructure gear today that was making infrastructure gear five or 10 years ago. Um, now, the organizations are. But the people aren't, and I think this is. They think this is across the industry. The people who are making Wi-Fi six E products today never built an edge of a B access point, right? The people who are the people who have the propeller hats and the coat bottle glasses, right? Those same people aren't the same people who have that legacy heritage that has always been in play. And so now we're talking about building twenty year old specification into product that people have never touched before. And I think that's that's from the top down. It's every it's all the major players. It's it's Cisco. It's Aruba. It's Mist. It's it, it's it's all of them. Um, and that becomes a problem for us, especially with these legacy compatibility issues that we're running into that drive all of this client behavior for us. I would say you've you've seen a similar problem in a lot of other places in the networking space where. Um... People who have not had experience with low speed networking, whether it's, you know, ISDN lines or very, very um, tiny Ethernet connections, um, will want to go back and rewrite routing protocols because, oh, OSPF is inefficient because it sends really small hello packets. If we sent really big hello packets, then we could exchange the whole table at once. And we're like, yeah, you've never tried to send a one meg hello packet over a 56K link and it shows. So yeah, I think that you're right that a lot of the people who are currently looking at building these technologies are like, yeah, who would ever use a one meg data rate? And we're like, uh, you know, back in 2004, that's what we had. You didn't have any other options. So is there an education aspect to this? Is there, a, you know, we're going to turn off all the high data rates and make you guys learn to live with, you know, the, the low stuff, the 5.5 meg data rates for a little while. So now you know what it felt like back in the early days and, and you're more willing to kind of look at other options or are we just going to let folks who think that the past is a cute little thing to read on wikipedia dictate how things are going to work in the future well and and i think there's a an interesting opportunity that we're approaching right now with six gigahertz and wi-fi 6e uh in that um we we don't necessarily have to carry all this legacy uh baggage with us uh, i mean think about one of the things that always kind of boggles my mind with 11N and AC and even AX um, is that we still have these like, you know, uh, OFDM data rates that we deal with. And it's like, okay, here's your, your one through 54 that you get uh, to define. And when most people talk about trimming data rates, that's what we're talking about. And that has zero impact on all these MCS rates that we've been layering on. So while you said, oh, I, I made 54 the, the minimum, um, that client can still use seven megabits per second because that's an, that's an N MCS rate, right? And so I, I feel like not only do we, we have some challenges in all this legacy stuff with, with, with that and, and MCS rates and, and traditional uh, data rates not, you know, necessarily obeying by the same rules, but now we get into Wi-Fi 6E when we're in 6 gig and we don't have to deal with legacy stuff. Is that, you know, eh, suddenly now we're, we're WPA3 only. Is that our, is that our break point where we can send really big routing packets and not have to worry about backwards compatibility with, you know, like the net? Uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, but well, I'm, you I'm hopeful it's going to get better. <laughs> The, the, the reason behind disabling low data rates to begin with, the reason this is ever, the reason this is even a concept in our industry is because of inefficient modulation. And when you have too many SSIDs or too many radios and you are chewing up airtime inefficiently, this isn't the problem of, hey, one megabit per second takes one megabit per second and 12 is 12x the speed. It's different modulation types, right? One is CCK modulation, one is OFDM modulation. And OFDM modulation is far more efficient than CCK modulation, not just in speeds and feeds, but you use less air at the same data rate 
with OFDM modulation than you do CCK modulation. So the whole point of getting rid of the low data rates is to, is to decrease spectral load or increase spectral efficiency by getting CCK modulation out of the air. And when you get rid of CCK data rates, everything, the only thing that's left is OFDM rates. And that's OFDM rates from 811G all the way on through to, to Wi-Fi 6E running in 6 gigahertz. The spectral impact to disabling OFDM data rates is negligible at best. Uh, diminishing returns is, is where you're at here. In, in my book, disabling low data rates is, is about getting rid of CCK modulation, not about getting things faster. And, and, and the people who are like, oh, yeah, I disable up to 36 megabits per second or 54 megabits, per second, none of that garbage matters. None of it matters. So well, um, just uh, want to add a little bit to that. Um, I, I think that there's also a consulting and kind of like a design aspect to all this uh, as well, right? Um, I think optics matter at times as well. So um, I've been in situation in designs uh, where <laughs> users will at, at times, so there's higher data rates obviously and, and, the, and the coverage is not like, you know, uh, 100% and there's some coverage gaps and all that kind of stuff. Um, and users can see, oh, you know, I only get like, you know, one bar or two bar over here. So again, that's where I'm talking about optics, right? Because they're looking at the bars. Um, so now if you enable six, six meg, okay, like, you know, now they can connect a little bit more further. Uh, they can see more bars and uh, they're not as concerned about uh, the, the, like how fast, like, you know, they're not running going to fast.com or speedtest.net or, or running some kind of, some kind of iperfs and all that kind of stuff. They look at the bars and they're happy. Oh, I got full bars. I'm very happy. You know, I'm getting that. So, so that, I think that also plays a, a role in here, depending on again, you know, the environment, uh, and, and the customer. Okay. Can I put on my way back hat for a second? Cause, cause when we upgraded our modem banks from 28, eight modems to 33, six modems, and you know how many phone calls I got from people who were like, yeah, but when I connect, it says 28.8, not 33.6, and I want that speed. They don't realize that's an initial dial-up connection speed. And in order to actually figure out what speed you're connected at, whether it's 56K or one of those intermediary speeds, you have to actually stress the connection. That, that This is not a new problem for us. So the, the optics of, oh, I connect slow because the gauge looks bad. Uh, is something that we've been dealing with for literally since the days of dialogue. It was. It is just as irrelevant today as it was then. I guess is that not not to not to speak badly about uh, about your comment there, Ali. But it, it, those aren't real tangible problems. Yes, but how many times have we fixed an issue with a customer, as Ali said, where we turned on something that theoretically would reduce the customer experience from a from a behind the scenes perspective? but it makes the optics better so everybody's happier i mean i've i've done that where like you turn on outlook syncing so that your outlook opens up right away as opposed to waiting to pull all the messages down from the server because when your mailbox is gigabytes and gigabytes in size it takes forever and suddenly now everything is so much better even though you know there's delay in email and all that other stuff i mean it is full of these solutions if you will but how does that impact design I mean, do we do we compromise our design for our users? Because ultimately, it, it, think about designing Wi-Fi in a large public venue. If nobody comes to the stadium, there's nothing. There's no reason to have Wi-Fi. So, do we do we look at this and we say, okay, well, we're going to make these design compromises and thoroughly document them because it makes our users effectively happier, even if the purity of our solution, because we designed this perfect setup with the perfect antennas and cell sizes are the way that they should be. But, you know, somebody says, well, you know, when I'm sitting in my seat, I only have one bar of connectivity. How far do we take that? Well, I, uh, anyone who's who's ever had to turn on 40 megahertz channels because the boss wants to see the number um, knows that that uh, you know, all of these decisions are compromises. Uh, and uh, we, we run into perception is reality a lot. Like I did a hospital once and I went in, they had, had a terrible design. They had brand new equipment. And the answer was, we have to replace all the APs. And I'm like, but, but we can fix this. We can just move some APs around and it'll be fine. And they're like, no, no, you don't understand. Like they see that box on the ceiling with that logo. 
and they associate the, the terrible experience. You could fix it. He's like, we'll still get tickets for the next three years saying that the, the, the Wi-Fi sucks. And so sometimes we do these things for, for the optics of it because the perception is, is that you know more bars equals better when we, we really know that the, what bars mean um, uh, is, is just a subjective number to make you feel good, right? Um, and we, we sometimes have to balance that, right? Sometimes I got to deploy 40 megahertz channels so the boss feels good about seeing the big number and he can show that off on a, on a Zoom call, right? Um, those are kind of the, the, some of the compromises we make in addition to like, well, I'm gonna trim some data rates for better efficiency, but not necessarily like shrinking cell size. I'm gonna control that with, you know, my RF design and my antennas, my transmit power, all of those things that we, we should be doing for design. And then sometimes we say, well, I'm gonna compromise and, and, and enable that one extra rate so that people see a better experience or, or people get a better perception of what we're doing. I think it's it's that way in IT for everything. <laughs> I was just say uh, so I, I think it also depends. Like you know, yeah, there are compromises. I mean, there's budget budget constraints involved, and uh, you know, um, in all this too. Uh, but at the same time, I don't. I, I want to. I only try to go and, and push it to the to the point where I feel like it's not going to um, like uh, create a chaos, like in the end, right? Um, so you can only push it to a certain limit. Uh, at the same time, so you know, there's always a conversation on uh, with, with the customer on this. Okay, you see, more bars does not mean always good, or green, all green does not in an Ekahal heat map does not mean always good because you can have all all the bars showing good RSSI and everything like that, but the quality of signal at SNR is like really low, and it's it's you know then 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 those bars are not going to help you, right? So you kind of have to sometimes balance it out too and figure it out what's what's what works and if it's a best decision for that customer, uh, you know, okay, if I enable six mag, they will see good bars and will they still at least meet the certain SLA? So they're happy with that. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it gets complicated and you kind of require some testing and you have to figure out, you know, where you want to actually uh, exactly set those numbers. So I think we've, we've pretty much hunted this premise right into the ground that cell sizes should not be dictated by data rates, but somewhere out there, in the near future, some wireless architect is gonna be playing around in their planning application of choice and they're gonna be tempted to click that button to remove a data rate to shrink the cell size. And hopefully there'll be a little voice in the back of their head that says, don't do that, do this instead. I wanna ask our experts here. Jake, what should they do instead? What's one thing that they should use to manipulate cell size that isn't changing the data rate? Antennas. That's pretty cut and dried. I like that. <laughs> Sam. Power. Power. Okay. I, I could see that too. Ali. There's, a, there's only one other thing left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have, uh, well, I don't know if it's the, if it's, that's what you're thinking or not, but I, I have used, utilized actually the building environments, uh, actually, uh, a lot of times to actually, you know, manipulate with my cell sizes, uh, and, and, you know, the wave propagation. Prior to deploying your, RF, you pick location first, then you pick the antenna, then you change the power level. After deploying your AP, you change the power level, you change the antenna, you change the location. You do them in reverse order, depending on where your assets are at in the ceiling. And 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 Ali, I think, uh, buttoned that up very, very nicely, which is location, 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 right? That that That's what you do. Actually, that just reminded me, one of my CW... Uh, an ESA was on one of uh, on this topic as well, actually one of them. I think that this is a great way for you to look at one of those rules of thumb that gets used all over the industry and say, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So remember that the next time that you're in your planning application and it looks like there's a simple solution to this problem, it's probably not as simple as you think, and there's probably a better way to do it. And the next time someone suggests to you to do it that way, maybe you could um, show them this episode of the on-premise IT roundtable and, and get a little bit of education about why that's a, a bad idea. 
All right. Well, I want to thank each of our guests for being a part of the podcast today. Um, you can always find the latest episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable on our website, gestaltit.com slash podcast. You can also find us on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gestaltit video. Why don't you go ahead and subscribe and turn on notifications so that you'll know when the latest episode gets published, as well as some of the other things that we do, including unboxing videos and longer form video essays like Conversations and Checksum. You can also subscribe to our podcast in your favorite podcast application of choice. Um, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes. And if you do that, please make sure you leave us a rating and a review because people actually do read those things. And that helps them understand what we're all about, that we are using the word premise correctly here, and that they should definitely take a listen if they're into enterprise technology. We should be back in a couple of weeks with another great episode. And I want to hope that you will all tune in for that. Uh, but for now, for myself, Tom Hollingsworth, our great guests, our staff here at Gestalt IT and our wonderful community, thank you very much for tuning in. And remember that we will be back very soon.